All right. I am here to introduce Elliot Rosenstock, a psychotherapist who lives in California, who I believe you still edit for the Young Freudians, correct? Correct. And um, Zero Books published him. Um, he's one of the few people who I've challenged to a duel and voted to publish his book. So um, this should be interesting. Come on, Elliot. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hello, Inquisition. <laughs> so, uh, hello, everyone. Good to be here in Boise. This is also written down before I got into Boise, but the letter will arrive at its destination, certainly. Uh, I think it is imperative that it should be mentioned at least once in this conference, and it has been, that Jordan Peterson emerged with the deadlock between himself and someone trying to refute him. Um, so the emergence of Jordan Peterson is this deadlock in some sense, right? The left anger with the conservative sort of abstractions and the provocations. So here we are, of course, returning uh, the repressed, but this is do not despair because I do not believe that the left is in error doing something like this. this um, we are strengthening ourselves. Uh, we're understanding what's wrong with Peterson. When we understand what's wrong with Peterson, we can understand the left. I, I don't know about the amalgam of converting Peterson uh, liberals uh, to our cause. I think we can learn for ourselves. So, uh, There's a stoic wisdom which says it's easier to conquer a city than a man, but maybe we can also make a city from a man, a uh, different man. So I'm talking here today with a lot of people who don't like Jordan Peterson, so I don't need to convince you not to like him. Uh, so I thought, how could I do this maybe in a little different way uh, than has been done so far today? So I titled this a Women and Lobsters, Stereotypes and Archetypes. but. I decided to pick the big other. I think you can pick a big other in some extent. So I picked Jordan Peterson. And I thought, what, how would I try to convince Jordan Peterson as futile as that may be? I thought that might be a good uh, frame of reference. Uh, I don't know if I can, but maybe, maybe, maybe it will. So I thought I would build on common ground, being, being a, you know, you could call an anarcho-liberal, if something like that, in a sort of materialist, uh, communist context. Here. Uh, this sort of thing makes me uh, <laughs> a bit too ill to try to to try to refute someone like Jordan Peterson. I think it would be lowering myself <laughs> in a bit, not just into my personal value set. It would sort of make me sick to stand here and be like, ah, I got you now. Haha, I got you now, you son of a bitch, as they say in transactional analysis, that is as a proper phrase. Uh, and as a psychotherapist, the instinct is to help, right? So anyway, let's, let's keep going. So Peterson likes Carl Rogers, a humanist psychotherapist, so I thought I might start with that. What is my goal in life? What am I striving for? What is my purpose? These are questions which every individual asks himself at one time or another, sometimes calmly and meditatively, sometimes in agonizing uncertainty or despair. They're old, old questions which have been asked and answered in every century of history, yet they are also questions which every individual must ask and answer for himself in his own way. They are questions which I, as a counselor, here expressed in many differing ways as men and women in personal distress try to learn or understand or choose the direction which their lives are taking. This quote is by Carl Rogers, as I said, humanist psychotherapist. There's a Lacanian schema which is not as well known as his other ones in Seminar 5. Uh, it's simply a square with a line through the middle diagonally and the top states reality. This is before sort of uh, the fully developed real that he develops later, and the other side states symbol. Uh, reality, 
symbol. Simple, boring, but it's important. The Lacanian argument is that through the representation of the symbol to reality is the mechanism of enjoyment. Here's where the conservatives, I'm sure, get a lot out of Jordan Peterson. Countless symbols and examples which are describing the reality, their truth narratives. The symbol represents the reality, but here Jordan Peterson is creating the new symbols, uh, something which I'm sure the new symbolization project understands on some level. In Lacan's critique of Melanie Klein's object relations theory, uh, he describes this as sort of the closed system of the mother. Lacan talks about the desire of the other, uh, which is satisfied by the closed system. Uh, on that note, here are some archetypes. The hero, mastery, the lover, intimacy, the caregiver, service. I think it is important to address, since it is what I would call the primary satisfier of the desire of the other in Peterson's view, the archetypes here. The lobster satisfies the other by becoming dominant. This is a closed system of dominance. The woman paints her nails to satisfy the other of the man. There is always the desire of other, because there is some place somewhere in the wide world of nail painting where it has something to do with sexuality. Uh, I don't know if you saw his Vice interview where he, he states, because somewhere there is a truth that somebody painted their nails maybe to look like better looking, that he made a universal rule out of it. But that is, that is one big other that he is creating and calling universal uh, through the logic of the archetype. Uh, the woman's benign nail painting turns into the means to satisfy the other because in the system of archetypes, that is how all things must function. Uh, intimacy is created through sacrifice, sacrifice to help the other. Helping your family, at what is a highly Freudian example, as someone pointed out earlier, he has those Freudian Jung examples, of the dissonance involved with the paternal signifier, the father's funeral, as described by Peterson. You can help your family at your father's funeral. You can satisfy the maternal desire while honoring your father and killing him. Truly a wonderful picture. Uh, problem with solving through images, whose systems? It's the obvious one. Uh, here we have Kafka. It is quite clear that the father does not castrate the mother of something that she does not have, for it is for it to be posited that she does not have it, it has to already been projected onto the symbolic plane as a symbol. Importance of symbols and enjoyment. From seminar five again. At this level, the question that arises is, to be or not to be the phallus? On the imaginary plane, the question for the subject is one of being or not being the phallus. The phase that is to be passed through places put the subject in the position of choosing. Put this choosing in quotes, moreover, since the subject is as much passive as active there for the good reason that he is not the one pulling the strings of the symbolic. So what does Lacan mean by this? The call to the desire of the other is answered by embodying the one who can satisfy the demand of the other, which demands, if we look at archetypes again, in the hero's case, mastery closed system of object relations, of archetypes. Uh, here we have a sordid Gregor Samza. Uh, <laughs> I really like this picture, actually. <laughs> here we have a picture of Gregor Samza after he sorted himself out. CEO. <laughs> yes, there is an alternative to the world of images, which Peterson gets his meaning from, the fantasy world the realm of the symbolic. There's clearly a fear of loss of all meaning, but it should not be seen as simple, nothing means anything, loss of meaning. The trauma that, it, that the symbolic is predicated on the imaginary is not the same thing as there is no meaning. It's predicated on fantasy and imagery. In other words, the words of symbols and laws become predicated on fantasy. What is it that is essential, however, is where individualism comes in. The relation to the symbolic order is predicated upon this fantasy relationship. Symbolism 
and relation to humankind and various symbols will never be universalized. I'll say that again. It's quite important to my point. If you don't think it's important, that's fine. But it's quite important to my point. Very individual of me. Symbolism and relation to humankind and various symbols will never be universalized since there are different essential qualities to the primordial fantasy. Here we have Kafka's quote on self-mastery. Self-mastery is the desire within the endless emanations of my intellectual life to be effective at a certain radius. But if I am made to describe circles around me, then I had better do it without action, merely contemplating the whole extraordinary complex and taking nothing away with me but the strength that such an aspect, e contrario, would give me. If the primordial fantasy creates the symbolic, the relationship to the symbolic order, once a human creates themselves, will always have to be rediscovered again and again. But it is not located in the image itself. It is, in fact, located inside each individual. That is to say, its relationship is not a repeating universal. The dialectic is then this, the phallic fantasy and its relation to the symbol, uh, and then back again. And I like this image a lot because what advice would Jordan Peterson have to Kafka? Um, I think that's something worth thinking about. If Jordan Peterson had Kafka in his office, uh, how would would you would you uh, I don't know crush this the great <laughs> this great literary figure through these sort of roles and through these sort of basic common uh, ideas? Uh, would you would you give Socrates a suicide hotline number maybe? <laughs> So that's why not archetypes. The problem with archetypes is they work backwards. They work backwards effectively, but they work backwards. Archetypes are descriptions of repeating patterns which occur in literature, art, and day-to-day -day life. There's a familiarity to them. Uh, archetypes can make sense of raw data of dreams uh, backwards. Archetypes can make sense of events in our lives through narrative molars. That is, we take raw data and we make sense of them. And if you are a psychotherapist and you, are, you have a client in the room, that can be very useful if somebody is suicidal. You say, how do I, how do I fix this? You, you know, you're not, you, they say you're not supposed to fix the client, but certainly you're supposed to do something. So, <laughs> right? So that is, you know, that's the role of Jungian psychotherapy, in my opinion, and that's a worthwhile role. That's, that's no joke, but logically, it's, uh, it's not good because it doesn't, it doesn't go forward from the fantasy of the individual. You know. The Jungian lens extrapolates from the image, finding its hidden secret, but this is the process which negates the individual. The therapist can, of course, give meaning to people if utilizing these archetypes, but he cannot find a meaning. He cannot map existing meaning through archetypes, but only paint over existing meaning. Uh, to bring this brief session to its conclusion, <laughs> mapping of meaning would necessarily include deadlocks, uh, and how these deadlocks are resolved through individuals' participation within the symbolic order. And if you want to talk about Zizek in the clinic, uh, you should probably talk about Zizek and Zizek's sort of Kantian Hegel, which does the categories. Zizek does the Kantian categories, and he says at the very end of that deadlock is where the work is done. The image must be made actual by the word, uh, by participation. So to be a true individualist, you must give up the ghost, the ghost so to speak and conjure up another. The ghost is the recognition of these deadlocks which perpetuate each other and accepting their unresolvability or their unsynthetic nature. This is the point where we can improvise. Once we say, if you play chess, you can be a good chess player, but you have to learn like a set of already existing knowledge, right? And then you can improvise. You have to, you have to sort of work out you have to get to the logical conclusion. You can't, you know. I say that example 
because that's 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 one I use. It's one that works with clients typically. Sometimes, to give up the ghost of the archetype is difficult. After all, it is a useful tool to process raw data and create meaning, but it doesn't map meaning. It arranges the snaps backwards, as Nick Land would say. Meaning is mapped in the individual by the symbolic order, which is to say, from the word, from the fantasy. Uh, one can look at the image and conjure thousands of fantasies, but to map meaning, one must be able to hear a symbolization of the other, which may be completely counter to one's own symbolization. If you're a therapist uh, and you want to give space to your client, if you're a person and want to give space to another person, uh, you need to be able to do that. Uh, the archetype and the archetype's painting over effect. Uh, how do we, as the interpreter, project the least? Something important, right? How do we project something that is not there onto the other person as little as possible and give space to the other to express their individual nature? We must dare to be recepted, which is to say sort of a Freudian unmasculinity. There has to be an unknowing in order to know more, but an unknowing that is active. That is to say, an unknowing which understands goals are not intrinsic biologically. Uh, they are not to become top lobster <laughs> or to bring one order to one's community or to save the world because individuals have different value sets. If you're a psychotherapist, you might have very right-wing clients. You will definitely have a political clients. Their value sets, if you you cannot, well, you could turn everyone into, you know, your brand of uh, politico, but that would not be being a good therapist. So, or to address it to Jordan Peterson specifically, there must be a wider space made for a wider range of value sets. When the space is made, then one can call oneself a champion of individuality. You cannot be a champion of individuality if you cannot do that. Uh, as a good in and of itself and for itself. You can argue with that, but if you want to talk about individualism and, say, and, and weep in front of people about the individual, as Jordan Peterson has done, and you want to paint over the individual, there's something missing there. So I'm inviting Jordan Peterson uh, to drop young fully, become a Lacanian. <laughs> <laughs> come to a census. Just, just kidding. But something to keep in mind. Something to keep in mind. Of course, no one, no one really does that in the psychotherapy profession. You never see a Jungian just drop Jung. <laughs> an absolute individuality must contain radical difference. An absolute individuality as a goal uh, in and of itself for itself uh, must contain radical difference between people and allow radical difference as good for what is an absolute individuality without that difference, the non-synthetic deadlock out of which comes knowledge of what one is looking at, rather than a remembering of what one has seen. That's all I got. I used to, you know, if you watch Lacan speak, he sort of yells at people. <laughs> I used to wonder why it's like, get adrenaline, the nerves. Like, let's see. All right. Questions, comments? Um, so there's a, one of the few videos I've seen of Peterson actually addressing um, some stuff. He, he says that Lacan is completely senseless and also in the same sentence that Foucault is basic common sense. Do you think he's actually read any Lacan? See, this is why I don't want to refute Jordan Peterson. Okay. <laughs> it's like, why, why would I, like, what, where do I even start with that? You know, it's like, where do you, where do you start with, you know, a kid coming into, like, a fr like, an undergrad freshman class who hasn't read, you know, the book and says, well, what do you think? It's like, oh, well, I, I don't know. Maybe he has read it. He's from Canada. You know? <laughs> he speaks, he speaks, they speak some French in Canada, maybe, maybe someone show, flipped him a Lacan book, who knows? Let's, let's say he has read it. Let's just give him that credit. Sure. 
Why not? <laughs> um, so, w w when talking about archetypes, especially in relation to Peterson, um, this is just something I do, and I'm, I'm going to base a question off of it. Um, I, I kind of tend to think of when part Peterson says archetype, you can kind of just replace it with Leotard's meta narrative. Because especially when he uses it, he means map yourself to this specific picture of yourself. Tell yourself this story about yourself, and that's what a meta narrative is—the narrative we tell ourselves about ourselves. And you know, um, it's debatable how much that would actually work. You know, as fans claim that when they think of themselves as the mythical Aragorn coming back with the sh shards of Nar Narsil to. Uh, cut off the hand of Sauron. I messed that story up. That was a seal door, but we don't need to discuss that. <laughs> um, but it it helps them, is what they claim. But you know, it's also arguable that um, when when you're willing to go to the point where you say to yourself, "No, I am this thing. I want to be this thing. I want this ideal." you are essentially committing yourself to it by hook or by crook, you know, confirmation bias, which is one of the issues with archetypes in philosophy and, or in psychoanalysis and with Freud's book on dreams, because it's really easy to see a shape once you've been suggesting what the shape is. Um, so do you think Peterson kind of relies on this confusion of forms where he can basically hold up archetypes as being the grand solution to everything and at the same time kind of pull a bait and switch and let his people fix themselves, kind of. Yeah, well, what you said is, does it work? And then I would ask you, work to do what, right? Work to, work to take somebody who's dealing with depression and then make them feel less depressed if you ask them a number of how depressed they feel. So maybe it would work to do that, but uh, in terms of creating an individualism, an absolute sort of individualism that is respecting the individual autonomy of other people, I don't think it works to do that. Um, I, think, I think that's the answer to that question. I think, you know, he's a psychotherapist. So if you do psychotherapy, your job is to help your client in some way, right? Um, but when we're in the realm of public philosophy, um, you, have, you have to challenge his sort of value system, and his value system is individualism, right? Um, and if you challenge his value system properly, I think, you know, it says convincing Jordan Peterson. I really think if you look at, you, you want to refine your value system, it would help him. It would help him to hear something like this and to like, under, oh, geez, maybe I, you know, maybe I will consider that, if not, you know. Drop, drop the meta narrative, so to speak. You know. Get Jim Jeffries to talk about Lacan with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd watch it. <laughs> so when Jordan Peterson says that the new counterculture is to be useful and take up trade jobs and this kind of thing. I know you aren't supposed to interpret as a psychoanalyst, but let's let's ask: useful for who and for what? Well, what the counter think? counterculture. Who's who's counterculture is? Tr I think there's always been a right populist counterculture that, uh, that thought tra taking up a trade was, you know. So it's it's not like a, a new counterculture. Maybe it plugs into more easily plugs into the general alt-right counterculture, which is the, you know, against the symbolic order at all costs for jouissance, right, for enjoyment. Uh, the freedom of, uh, I guess, the pervert freedom versus sort of the hysteric freedom to ask questions to generate new information, right? So in that way, if you want to talk Zizek, right, you know, do not underestimate uh, the appeal of of uh, that that sort of liberal uh, idea of freedom against all symbols, but know that you are not necessarily free, right?
there's another kind of freedom. <laughs>